You know, I've been, I've been hearing a lot of like tragic stories in the last like week or so. You know, even today, one of the, one of my, the ushers in our church, he's a police officer and he said today there was a man in a, in, that was driving 100 miles per hour on Sierra Avenue in Fontana and just driving reckless and, and he's driving so reckless they're getting calls about there's someone ra- driving reckless, he's dangerous. He flips his car and he flips it, it rolls and rolls and it rolls over a car, the oncoming car and crushes that car. Um, the, both drivers, mom, the mother and the father die and maybe the child in the back might die too. And when I think about, you know, these stories that I hear on a daily basis, it's, it's happening. You just don't know when your number is going to come up. It makes us realize how important our subject, what we talk about, really is. Most people live their lives as if they're going to live and they're never going to die. So they don't prepare for eternity. And, and what our responsibility as believers is not only to be prepared through our faith in Jesus Christ, but also help others get prepared for eternity. We have an assignment. We have a mission. And our mission is to go out there and preach the good news about Jesus Christ, share our Jesus story, what Christ has done for you, how we saved you, what he did for every single person, and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Someone say, make disciples of Jesus Christ. So we're, this is the, the Bible's very simple. Follow Jesus, and then this is what you do next. Help people follow Jesus. So I follow Jesus, and I help people follow Jesus. Because Jesus, Jesus said this, and this is the church, church's name is the Way World Outreach. And, and, and we get it from John 14, 6, and it says this. Jesus said this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And what he was saying is, and he said this, no one goes to the Father, no one gets to heaven but through me. And we're saying if you want to get to the power, you want to get to heaven, you want to get a breakthrough, you want to be saved, you want to be forgiven, you want your broken heart to be healed, there's one name to call on. You don't have to go through a whole bunch of names. There's one name to call on. His name is Jesus. Call on him. And tonight you could call on him. And you don't have to have a perfect prayer. Just make a prayer. I need some help, Lord. And God will definitely intervene. So we've been taught going through the book of Matthew, and we, we, we're stopping right now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. And last week, we introduced a subject, um, and the subject's kind of weird in, in, in America because we introduced the subject of persecution. And the reason I say it's a little weird in America because there's not a lot of persecution, really, of Christians here in the United States of America. Uh, what I started realizing about persecution, persecution is a lot, it's the last resort of the devil. He doesn't use it unless he has to use it. And I'll tell you why in a little bit, why he doesn't use it unless he has to use it. But the purpose of persecution, it, persecution, what's the word persecution mean? It means to pursue with a desire to harass, to mistreat, to torture and destroy because of someone's beliefs, morals, and message. So they're, they're perse- you're being persecuted when, when the devil has actually assigned someone to you to harass you, hurt you, injure you because of your beliefs, your lifestyle, and your godly message. The enemy will not assign someone to harass you at this level unless you're a threat to his kingdom. That means he sees that you are actually impacting or messing up his systems. He goes, this person, I've tried the temptation, it didn't work. I tried the distraction, it didn't work. I tried to get him offended, it didn't work. I tried to get him caught up in his career. It didn't work. 
I tried to heartbreak, it didn't work. I tried to depress him, it didn't work. So now he's still going forward. She's still moving forward. She's still preaching. She's still sharing. She's still living. He's still doing it. Now we got to bring out the heavy artillery. Let's bring out some persecution. But the purpose of persecution is to shut you up and shut you down. What's the purpose of persecution? To shut you up and what? Now, we don't deal with that a lot in America because most Christians are shut up already. They, they're not shut up in church, but they're shut up at home. They're shut up in a neighborhood. You'll never get per persecution until you take this message and take it out there publicly. Persecution happens in public places. See, what God wants us to do is start infiltrating areas that the enemy has public places where crowds are meeting, that we're taking this message and we're assaulting that crowd with the greatest message in the world that Jesus came and he died for them so they could be saved, so they could be made whole. There's people that are empty, suicidal, depressed, in a cycle they can't break, hopeless, and they're waiting for an answer that they can't find. I got good news for every one of us. We are the answer. We just need to open up our mouths outside of church. You guys get this, right? I was kind of looking, let's look at Matthew 5.10, and I like it in the message. It says this, you're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. What, what, what this is saying is that your commitment to God is so, it, it, it's so, it, it penetrates, it penetrates the darkness, it's penetrating hearts, it's impacting people's lives, that this is what it does, it provokes the enemy, it provokes hell to come against you with some persecution. He goes, but the problem is when we respond properly, we're being persecuted, and we respond properly, it backfires on the devil. Someone say persecution can backfire on the enemy. What he meant to do was shut you down. But then if he can't shut you down and he doesn't discourage you, it drives you deeper into the power, deeper into the anointing, deeper into the revelation, deeper into being effective. You become more effective. You become more influential. You become more powerful after the persecution. So what was meant to tear you down is actually now driving you deeper Christian persecution, it may be surprising to some of you, but Christian persecution around the world, not here necessarily, is one of the biggest human rights issues of this era. A woman in India watches as her sister is dragged off by Hindu nationalists. She doesn't know if her sister is alive or dead. A man in North Korea prison camp is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious. The beatings begin again. A group of children are laughing and talking as they come down to their church's sanctuary after eating together. Instantly, many of them are killed by a bomb blast. It's Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. These Christians, these people don't live in the same region or even in the same continent but they share an important characteristic. They are all Christians, and they suffer because of their faith. While Christian persecution takes many forms, it is defined as, a, as any hostility experienced as a result of identification with Jesus Christ. From Sudan to Russia, from Nigeria to North Korea, from Colombia to India, followers of Christianity are targeted for their faith. They are attacked. They are discriminated against at work at, and at school. They risk sexual violence, torture, arrest, and much more. The reason I'm sharing this, because this has actually happened, 
happening right now in other nations. I said, Pastor, why would God want to talk to us Americans about persecution? See, this is what God does. He prepares us to have a backbone to be able to handle what is coming. All I'm saying, the more effective you become, the more on fire you become as a believer, understand there will, you'll get to a place, we as a church will get to a place as we're turning the city of Pomona upside down. As we're going to TJ and we're dealing with all the drug trafficking out there, the prostitution out there, the spirits of religion out there, when we go out there and we start turning TJ upside down, we start turning Pomona upside down, we start, we start turning Watts and, and Compton upside down, there's going to be a spirit, spiritual wickedness, high places they are going to say, wait a second, we got to shut down the way. Now there's two sorts of, 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 of persecution. One is physical persecution. I remember one day, me and my, me and my friend, uh, we went to the Rose Parade. And we went to the Rose Parade, not to watch the Rose Parade, but the, the night before the Rose Parade, it's a big party on the streets. So me and my friend, we went down there and we're passing out Bible tracts and sharing our faith and witnessing for hours. We run into someone that takes our Bible track and eats it. And I go, wow, that's interesting. Like it's not food, right? He eats it, but he looks at me really mean, and then he spits it out in my face. That was the beginning of the spirit using someone, the devil using someone to let me know this is my territory, it's not yours. That's what I would say physical persecution. And then there's also verbal persecution. This is when people start lying about you, saying all kinds of evil things about you. They slander your name. What are you going to do? And they're slandering your name because of who you follow and how you live. They start thinking, they start saying that you're, you're a hate monger and you're, 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 you're a religious zealot and all, all kinds of names that they might, that's an old biblical name, but <laughs> the, I don't even know what names they'll call you nowadays. But the idea here is, is understand words sometimes have more power than physical physical persecution, all God is saying, if you're doing what I've asked you to do and you're sharing my faith with everyone you meet and you're willing to bring this out in the public place and you're willing to shine your light, understand there will be backlash, but I'm promising you this, when the backlash comes, a bigger blessing is going to be released upon your life. It's going to actually be your promotion, not your demotion. Now, let's talk about how to respond to persecution because the response is really important. Respond to persecution. This would maybe even follow under how to respond to people that aren't nice. We'll start at that little level because if you can't overcome people that are not nice, there's no way you're going to handle persecution. Persecution is a whole nother level. The, some of us are being tested by someone and all they're doing is developing an ability for you to handle some negativity. You think it's persecution. It's not persecution. They're just getting on your nerves. But if, if the enemy could send just a, someone that gossips a lot and get on your nerves, I don't even know why I don't like her. I just don't like her. You're not ready for persecution because the enemy could just use obnoxious people to get you off track. But let's go ahead and talk about just the obnoxious people or the people you don't like. We got to learn how to respond to people that are unfavorable and make sure that their mindset doesn't overcome your emotions. You know, you know how you get conquered by someone that you don't like when you start acting like them. Well, how do I act like them? 
They cuss you out, you cuss them out. They just conquered you. I thought we were here to praise the Lord. Well, you made me mad. No one can make you mad. You choose to be mad. Stop blaming people for your emotional dysfunction. I sound like a psychiatrist. Emotional dysfunction, that's what you got. You got to take control of your response. You can't always control whether you're going to be persecuted, treated right or not, but you can control your response. So let's look what Jesus says about persecution. And again, in Matthew 5:11, it says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. So now I want you to get this. They're persecuting you because you are what? His follower. Because you're a what? You're known as his follower. If no one knows that you're his follower and you're dealing with what you think is persecution, it's not persecution. They don't even know you follow Jesus. They'd have to know that you're following Jesus, living for him, for you to actually start experiencing persecution. You got to become a Christian that comes out of the closet. It's okay to be in a prayer closet, but you can't stay there all day. Some of you from, from our hoods and our neighborhoods, you are gang affiliated. You were so gang affiliated that you tattooed the name of your gang on your head. And then you even sacrificed your hair to show the tattoo. Right here. SFR. Right? When you used to represent that, you used to ask people where they're from. Not because you were trying to be kind. Like, where are you from? Back east? No. From south side or north side? What are you? You were trying to pick a fight because you wanted to let them know where you were from. There was lifestyles that we lived that we were so proud of, we represented it, they looked at us, and they knew what group we belonged to. But now, as Christians, could we, be, could, we, could, could we be at a place that we're so worldly that no one even knows we're blending in so well that we don't stand out at all? We talk like them, we walk like them, we dress like them, we look like them. We live like them, we drink like them, we smoke like them, we cuss like them, we, we're immoral like them. And the only difference is we go to church on Sunday or on Easter or on Christmas. But you're not going to be persecuted because you call yourself a Christian. You're going to be persecuted because you're going to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, you know what's trippy about all this? Is that the world knows how you're supposed to act. Have you ever said you're a Christian and you do something that's not Christian-like and you get non-Christians that don't even know nothing about God, haven't been to church a whole lot? I thought you say you were a Christian. <laughs> oh, so you're a Christian expert now. <laughs> do you know why? Because everybody knows, the Bible says that God writes his laws on our hearts so we know what Christ should be like. We know what a believer should behave like. We know how they should talk. We know how they should walk. And what God is saying, when you start talking it and you start walking it and you start speaking it, then they're going to know you're a believer. And when they find out you're a believer, then you qualify for persecution. Say, Pastor, qualify? Is this something we want to qualify for? Like, are you trying to like, what, what? Yeah, I want a church full of people that are persecution qualified. That when we enter a city, when we enter a neighborhood, when we enter a party, all of a sudden, hey, man, man, sh hey, whoa, 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 they just showed up. I'm going to give you something about the spiritual realm. 
It was, uh, it was three years back. Three years back, I went to Las Vegas. And actually, I was like in Henderson on the border, but we'd go visit this trip, come back. I wasn't gambling. Just stop tripping. <laughs> We're doing tourist stuff, right? But the first night that I stayed there, something really radical happened. A demon visited my room. I saw the demon. And this demon was a weird looking thing. He was super muscular. But he had woman body parts. Like, that ain't look right. <laughs> he was a gangster. And, 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 and he asked me this question. This is what he says. What are you doing here? And basically what he was saying, why are you here? Because we already know that the call on your life is to take over cities. We don't want you here. That night tried to attack me. Of course, it didn't work. I'm here. I'm, we're here. I say, Pastor, is, 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 is that make you any more special? No, I'm, all I'm saying is we belong to the same organization, the Church of Jesus Christ. We represent Christ. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if the first disciples were persecution qualified, the followers of Jesus Christ in 2021 shouldn't be the watered down version of what they used to be. We should become, get to the point that we're persecution qualified, that we're ready to go in there and make a difference. Is there anybody willing to die for this thing? And until you're willing to die for it, it's not going to be fun. You guys are, what kind of crazy church is this? So now, response number one. How do we respond? Number one, respond with praise. Someone respond with praise. We cannot let persecutors conquer our relationship with God and our emotions with hate, anger, bitterness, payback, frustration, doubt, fear, anxiety, worry. God blesses you when people mock you. In the scripture that says, in Matthew 5.12, it says, Matthew 5.12 says, be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. What he's saying is, you're in good company. We're being persecuted. Every single major prophet in the Bible was persecuted. He goes, they were persecuted. Now you're living for me. You're going to be persecuted, but you're in great company. Remember, every single one of those world changers had some resistance because they were making an impact. God is saying, this church, you as an individual, no longer are you going to live a whole home, lukewarm life, worldly life. You're going to live a life on fire. Fire sold out for God. And when the persecution comes, they're going to squeeze you. And when you squeeze a lemon, lemon juice comes out. Hey. <laughs> Pastor, that's deep. You squeeze an orange, you create orange juice. You squeeze a watermelon, you pop it. But if you keep squeezing, you'll make some watermelon, something. So what happens when you squeeze a devoted follower of Jesus Christ? You squeeze me, no cuss words come out, no anger comes out, no hate comes out. What comes out of me is just some praise. The more you squeeze me, the more I praise and magnify my Lord. Is there anybody here that can praise God in difficult pressure situations that under pressure, you still got some praise? Or are you one of those Dodger fans? I'm not, don't, don't. I can see, see, all right, all right do, don't you mess with my Dodgers. I felt the spirit of resistance. You're persecuting me. 
But are you one of those Dodger fans that they're down by three runs in the ninth and you're in your car driving home? I'm not one of those Dodger fans. If I'm there, I want to see the whole game to the last out. And, I, and if they lose, I say, I don't even think they lost yet. Maybe they're going to come back. I don't even know what's going on. You know what that means? Is that you're still believing even when your team is down. And what God is saying, when you praise God after they persecute you, and God says, be happy about it, be joyful about it, you know this, it's going to work out just fine. Can anybody praise God under pressure? Come on, get persecution certified. You say, praise God? Yeah. Yeah. Don't let the devil overcome your emotions. Praise will resist. You can't be, thank, I thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I might be going through a difficult time right now, and I might be going through a valley, but I know this, that you're a God that's with me in the ups and the downs. You're the, my shepherd. I shall not walk. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me, and if you're with me, who's going to come against me? I thank you, Lord, that you're the alpha. You're the omega. You're the beginning. You're the end. You're going to have the last word in this thing. It's not going to be my persecutors. It's not going to be my situation. I thank you, Lord, that you have all, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I thank you, Jesus, that I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I thank you, Lord. I'm going to get through this. I know it's going to end in victory. I thank you, Lord. Yeah, Jehovah Jireh, you're my provider. You're Jehovah Rapha. You're my healer. I thank you, Lord, that you're the prince of peace. I command this depression. Come on, can somebody just praise God under pressure like that? Anything that you're going through that's difficult right now is just helping you get persecution qualified. Because until you're persecution qualified, you can't be a world changer. Because you're too emotional. Why are you depressed? I got a flat tire today. The devil attacking my tires. You're depressed, you got a flat tire. Oh yeah, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Everything's going wrong. So depressed. Things were going good until this morning. But usually it starts on Monday, at least it got to Wednesday. You know what we're talking about? Can you keep your praise from here to your car? And from your car to your house? And from your house to your job? And from your job to the freeway? And from the freeway back to your house? And then do that on Sunday. And then do that on Monday. And then do that on Tuesday. And then do that on Wednesday. And can you keep your praise when someone gives you a bad report? The doctors say, man, we don't know what we're going to do with you. It don't matter. I guess you don't have the answer. But I serve a God. I understand this. I got eternal life. And he's with me in this dark moment. I'm going to be okay. Can anybody praise God when you get fired? Praise God when it's hard? Praise Praise God when someone's prejudiced against you and you're still praising. See, this is what he says. Jesus said this. He said this, be happy about it. Be happy about what? When they mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all kinds of evil things against you because you're my followers. He goes, be happy about it. Be very glad, exclamation point, exclamation point, for a great reward awaits you. We can respond with praise because we know that after great persecution, after great trials, come great rewards, great victories, great growth, great influence, a great harvest for the kingdom. After great trials, great persecution, great difficulties, come great, 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 great rewards. What God is saying, the persecution is going to release your destiny upon your life. Don't fear it. Face it. I'll bless you every time you're there for me. We covered this last week. 
You're not persecuted if you ain't living right. That's called consequences. <laughs> the devil, the devil's not, I'm not even in this. Like, you don't threaten me at all because I, I got chains all over you. I know what you do when you leave church. You go straight to the porn site. Do you think I'm going to, do you think I'm going to persecute you? Why would I waste my big demons on you? <laughs> it's getting quiet up in here. Too many people doing that when they leave church. <laughs> you guys understand that? You're a struggling Christian, but you're not being a powerful Christian. And, and God didn't give you his Holy Spirit so you could be weak. He gave you his Holy Spirit. I want you to get this, the Spirit of Jesus so you could be like Jesus. You could say no to those traps, no to those chains, no to those habits, so you could start making, come on, if God can't make a major impact in your life, he can't make a major impact through your life. Pastor, you know, I just, I just like to drink a little bit. That's your problem. Instead of depending on the Holy Spirit to give you some peace, you're still acting like you used to be. Well, you know, I, I don't get drunk. Stop making excuses for your mediocre lifestyle. Why don't you get sold out for Christ and try, stop trying to use Scripture to justify your worldliness? Oh, Lord. Someone say, praise God. Look, at, we can be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward, you, great reward awaits you what? In heaven. He said, when it's all said and done, you know how this ends. You know why you could be praising God in the middle of the toughest time in your life? Because you already know how it ends. It's all in the script. I watched um, the other day, Fast Furious 9. 5, 9, F9, whatever it is. But some of the stuff that happened there was like totally unbelievable. How many seen F9? I mean, it's just, it's no way. It's just no way that it would ever happen. You're dead. But how do they get out of every one of those dead? It's just impossible. You can't do it. There's a cliff. You're, dri you're driving over the cliff, and all of a sudden you drive over the cliff, and, uh, and your, your car gets hooked on to, a, to some, some fallen bridge out there, and it takes you to the other side. That's a real scene. <laughs> when have you ever seen that? But why does it work? Because it's in the script. So I'm not tripping. I already know he ain't dying. It's too early in the movie. I said, Pastor, it was exciting. But I do know this. Right now, you might be in an exciting place, a difficult place. But don't you worry about it. You just keep following Jesus. Keep living for him. Come on. Keep testifying. Keep making disciples of Jesus Christ. And God is saying, it's already in the script. Great reward is in your future. So that's why you could praise God right now. Come on. Give God just a little praise right now. Someone say, respond with praise. Be glad about it. Be happy about it. I want you to, we're going to end it with this, but what was crazy about this is that, is that Jesus is sharing about persecution before there was any persecution. So it was not like they were being persecuted. They were in a huddle, in a meeting. He's preaching, and, and they're just at his feet while he's preaching, and he just brings out this persecution sentence. And actually, it's actually two sentences, two verses. And I'm sure it went in one ear out the other, but the first time that they were persecuted, they went back to that verse and they go, oh, that's right, persecution, because of what we believe. 
because we're following Jesus. We're not being persecuted because we're liars. We're not being persecuted because we're sarcastic. We're not being persecuted just because someone doesn't like us. We're being persecuted because of our faith of who we represent. And this message is so powerful, it's intimidating the enemy. Oh man, I don't think you know the power you got in you. This place right here, we shouldn't have any, any empty seats because you should leave here on fire. I was, I'm gonna give you an example. I was at, um, uh, at Ralph's on 4th of July. Why am I at Ralph's on 4th of July? Because Lisa wanted me to go get some rice. I'm like the, not the best guy to send to do anything. I might show up another three hours later. Where's Marco? Where's Marco? Doing ministry, girl. We don't need your rice. We need Jesus. Man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, girl. So I'm at Ralph's, and while I'm there, Ralph's, I see a lady, she passes by, I go, hi. What, what, if, I, if you see me at Ralph's, I'm probably going to be saying hi if you just look near my way. I say, why would you say hi? Because you might belong to the way we're large. Right? And, I, oh, man, I saw Pastor Mark. He was so rude. <laughs> and I know how sensitive people are that they get taken out because I didn't say hi. <laughs> right? No, no persecution. I just didn't say hi. <laughs> I'll never go to the way we're allowed rich again. I see how he is. He thinks he's too good for all of us in the rice section. So, if you just look my way, hey, whoa, hey. <laughs> just in case. So this lady was looking at me like, hey, oh, hi, oh, and she stops. Hey, how you doing? And we began to talk. And she began to open up right there in, in, in the aisle. And she says, my, my grandson is suicidal. I don't know what to do with him. And I go, honey, have you been to church lately? She goes, I haven't. We're going, we're going, it's time to get back. Your son needs the presence of God. Your son needs to get set free. You're not just dealing with a mindset, a mental condition. You're dealing with a demonic attack, and you're going to need some power. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone and come to the house of God. Now, and, and your son needs to get mentored. He needs to become a disciple. He needs to be part of a growth group, a Power 12 group. He needs a mentor over his life. Let's get a mentor over his life. I'm saying that. And you know who walks right on my, 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 my aisle? The junior high pastor. I've never seen him outside of church, barely. He's right there at the aisle. Her, her grandson's 12 years old. He's the guy. And I go, Jesse, come right here. And she's thinking, like, this is a setup. What is going on? Do they, do they roll that deep? Do they were like, man, if I don't told them I, like, I, 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 had a, uh, I was going to prison. Was that the prison ministry in the corner? What's up? Like, did they have all, everybody in their whole ministry? On the, if I would have told them I'm hungry with the, with the food ministry, all of a sudden show up? But how many know God has this all organized? How many, come on, how many want to start walking in that divine power, that divine anointing, that when you're in the aisle, the power of God is moving out? So we exchange numbers. I pray with her right there in the aisle. There's another lady who comes by. Hi. And she just keeps going by. She goes, hi. She comes by. I'm still talking to this one. She comes back. She goes all the way down. She comes back. She goes, hey, are you a Christian? <laughs> like, you know I am. I'm here to get rice from my wife. I don't even care about that. We're going deeper here. <laughs> <I'm just> <laughs> so he, she comes over, and she starts sharing about her husband. I don't know this lady. She starts sharing about her husband and problems, whatever. He doesn't know God. I go, that's awesome. 
So we talk about that. All I'm saying, if we could take this out of the church and you could start living this life for real and you don't get trapped in your secret places, that your secret place turns into a place of worship, a place of praise, that you don't have this secret double life, but you start saying, I'm all in for Jesus Christ because I want to see God use me the way he used those apostles. He could use me in 2021. God, trust me with the trial. Trust me with the difficulties. Trust me with the persecution. And when they squeeze me, praise is coming out of me. Last verse, Paul and Silas respond with praise after being severely persecuted and see great power released. Someone say great power. After great persecution comes what? Great what? How many understand that God wants you to walk in great power? God wants a church that speaks word and power. Not just word. Signs follow when you speak. And the reason they follow when you speak, because you're following Jesus. Let's clap a little louder because I'm going to start thinking you're, all right, there we go. Oh, uh. Let's clap a little bit louder. So at least, come on, let's get some praise there. All right. We'll end it with this verse. But look at this verse. Put yourself in this verse. This church is going to be crazy. I'm telling you, if God's talking about this, we're ready to turn Pomona upside down. We're ready to turn TJ upside down. We're ready to turn your family upside down. We're ready to turn San Bernardino upside down. We're ready to turn inner cities upside down. Come on. God's going to turn your side world upside down. God's ready to use us. Come on. To go out there and be a light in this dark world. And of course, there's going to be some pushback, but we're ready for it. The title of this message, if you didn't know, persecution won't stop me. <laughs> Pastor, that's, you know, just relax. The devil's hearing you. I could care less. The devil's underneath my feet. He's already been defeated. Do you not know that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil? I don't care about no poltergeist stuff. I cast out demons and step on them. Come on, church. God, you already got the victory. The one that's in you is greater than anything you're facing. Let's, let's, let's end it. You guys are too crazy. Acts 16, 22, look what it says. A mob <laughs> quickly formed, check this out, against Paul and Silas. And the city officials, this is crazy. City officials are getting involved with Paul and Silas now. They stripped and beat and... Beat, beat, them, beat them with rods, wooden rods. Acts 16, 23. They were severely beaten. And then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. The jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing, and praising, and worshiping hymns to God. You put pressure on me, and what's going to come out of me is going to be some praise, and God inhabits the praises of his people, because if I could praise them in a dungeon, this is what happens. God will show up anywhere you praise them. Right now, it's not a time to cry. It's not a time to get depressed. It's not a time to give up. It's not a time to be hopeless. It's not a time to commit suicide. It's a time to praise God in your darkest moment, and watch God show up and this is it suddenly after the praise after the praying there was a massive earthquake after the persecution and the prison was shaken to its foundations 
and all the doors. And all the doors. Come on. The door of depression has to let you go. Come on. The door of anxiety has to let you go. The door of fear has to let you go. The door, come on. That door that you feel a torment has to let you go. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. There was a chain reaction and all God needed was a Christian that could handle some persecution and still praise them. Come on, everybody. Give God just one more praise. Let's all stand up. Pastor Robert, Pastor Robert, come on. Let's close this out. Everybody stand up. Now, I'm telling you, it's time to get on fire. It's time to get over yourself. Because God is saying, if you'll just give your life to me, I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. I'll put a joy in you that's not controlled by your outside circumstance. Because the joy is not going to be dependent on how well you're doing in this physical realm. It's going to depend on what's inside of you. Does anybody want some joy that's unspeakable? Come on, some peace. Come on, some peace. Let's get it from God. Let's sell out. You know, I'm going to have Pastor Robert close us out in prayer. But I tell you, I love you, church. But I ain't playing games. People are dying. People are coming to these altars, and some of them, after they leave here, are committing suicide. I ain't playing. We need some disciple makers. We need the power of God. Come on, we come on. We need the power of God. We gotta stop being offended. Let's let go of all the all the come on all the drama. Let go of all that and just make this real simple. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ that makes disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna live for Him till the day I die. I'm a humble servant, ready to reach the world with the gospel. God bless you. One more time. Let's give the Lord one more big hand. Yes, let's give Jesus a shout of praise today. Praise will come out when I'm persecuted. We will worship God when we're persecuted. How many received that word today? Look at the person next to you and tell them when I get persecuted, I will worship God. I will worship God when I get persecuted. Praise will come out of me. Praise will come out of me. How many praisers do we have in the house today? Doesn't matter what come against me, I will praise God. Now, as we come to a close in this service, everybody here in this auditorium, we don't want anybody moving. The only people that are moving right now is our altar team right now, our, our team that's getting ready to pray right now. You're watching online right now. This is your moment as well. You know, Pastor Marco mentioned it right before the sermon, so much tragedy, people losing their lives. Did you see what happened in Florida? Half, half of that condos just went down. How many seen that? How many seen that on the news? You, you got to watch the news just for a little bit. I don't know how big that, that building was. 10, 15 stories high. It was huge. 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, half the condos just collapse. They got 50, 60 people dead that they found. It's been over 14 days. They still can't, they're still searching for bodies in the rubbish. And then a storm hits. So half of the condo falls down. There's still 100, over 100 people still missing. Moms are waiting to see if they're going to find their son in the rubbish. Husbands are waiting to see if they're going to find their wives in the rubbish. Well, it's been over 14 days. Now a storm hits. The only thing I could think about what's ta what's taking them so long to get through that rubbish. I can't even I, I can't even fathom if I was at work and my wife was in that rubbish. I can't even fathom that. They showed a father the other day just crying and crying. They said, "Can you just find my son? I just want them to find my son in the rubbish." Two o'clock in the morning that happened. Most of them were fast asleep. They had no idea 
that their lives would be taken at 2 o'clock in the morning by just a collapse of a building. doesn't make any sense why it happened. So, Pastor, why are you sharing that story at the end of this? You guys, we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised the next two hours. We're not promised the next 45 minutes. The Bible says this, our life is like a vapor. We're here for one second and we're gone. That's how quick life is. We've done so many funerals here. We've done funerals of babies, of teenagers, of, of young adults, and yeah, the elderly. But tomorrow is not promised to you. Tomorrow is not promised to me. So here it goes. If you're saying, Pastor, you know what? I, I need to dedicate my life to Jesus. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Or, Pastor, I need to come back to him. I've been backslidden. I need to come back. Pastor, I'm not right with God. Okay, let me ask you this question. Here's the most important question anybody could ever ask you. Pay close attention online. Pay close attention. Here it goes. If you were to die tonight, all the way in the back row, if you were to die tonight, where will you spend eternity? Well, Pastor, I want to go to heaven. Well, how do we get to heaven? This is it. By placing our faith in Jesus. It's not about a religion. I'm not saying, hey, everybody, come join the Pentecostals. It's not about a religion. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus, the one who died on the cross for us. So here it goes. I'm going to count to three. Don't let this moment pass you by. You're a young adult. Don't think, well, I got to the five years. I'm still young. You're not promised tomorrow, young people. Teenagers, you're not promised tomorrow. So here it goes. I'm going to count to three. If you're saying, Pastor, I need Jesus. I want Jesus to forgive me of all my sins. I want to make sure if I died today, then I would go straight to heaven. That is me. On the count of three all across this auditorium, all those watching online, when I say the number three, get ready to lift your hand up as fast as you can. You're going to say, Pastor, that's me. I need Jesus. I want to get right with God. I want to surrender to God today. That's me. I'm going to count to three. Don't let nothing hold your hand down. Here it goes. One, you're online. You're watching. Get ready to slip your hand up as well. You're at work. You're in your living room right now. Get ready to slip your hand. Heaven's going to see your hand right there. When I count to three, all across this auditorium, raise your hands. If you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, one, two, three. Right now, raise your hands. Raise your hands. I see a hand over here. I see a hand over there. I see a hand over there. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands. I see a hand there. 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 I see two hands way in the back. Yeah, I see those hands. I see one, two, three, four, five hands way in the back over there. Yes. All those who just raised your hands, I want you to come meet me over here in the front. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer of salvation today. All the way in the back. Come on down. Come on down. This is your day.